I have another little exercise today for you, uh, and that is uh, to uh, talk a bit about the education of psychiatrists, uh, and uh, especially education at the present time. Uh, psychiatrists have been getting a, a bit of a hard, uh, uh, well, a hard rap today. <laughs> They've been, we, we, we've been getting some hard knocks. <clears throat> but uh, I think uh, it, it's helpful now to take a look at uh, psychiatry in relationship to, to its uh, uh, fundamental discipline in medicine and tell you a little story about medicine and Johns Hopkins that will uh, give you an idea of uh, uh, why we're uh, here today, uh, why uh, People are mad at Johns Hopkins outside on the picket line, and uh, why we don't really have to worry, okay? All of those things uh, simultaneously. <clears throat> uh, um, because all of this is pretty much a repetition in, in many ways of what happened 100 years ago in medicine and where Johns Hopkins took a tremendous lead. Um, if you remember, if remember, well, maybe 110 or 115 years ago when uh, Hopkins was being founded, um, American medicine was a mess. Uh, it was a mess uh, because, uh, well, it had been demonstrated to be a mess uh, by the Civil War, uh, where the doctors involved uh, in both armies could do little more than lop off limbs uh, and uh, wait for people to die uh, or recover. And, uh, the uh, capacity of the doctors uh, to prevent disease, uh, to cure disease, uh, to understand disease was ex extremely limited. And it was limited not just because of the limitations of knowledge. You could say, well, gee, uh, 115 years ago we didn't know much. But it was limited because of the educational programs that had been built into the American medical uh, uh, schools uh, from their foundations. Uh, the medical schools of that time and previous uh, said that the job of doctors was to treat disease and our job in medical school is to teach them how to treat disease. We are going to make therapists, okay? And we had medical schools teaching all kinds of therapy. We had um, homeopathic therapy, we had eclectic therapy, we had all kinds of therapy being taught in these various medical schools. The problem was, as Oliver Wendell Holmes was saying uh, at the time, you know, you could uh, uh, throw most of the medicines and the treatments into the sea and it would be better off for mankind and worse for the fish. <laughs> and it was true. Uh, it was true because these therapies were all uh, kind of dis stumbled on by accident. Some of them were good, by the way. I mean, morphine had been discovered, and digitalis was around, and uh, a few things, but nothing else. And as a result, uh, American people went through uh, each decade with a new, uh, a new theme uh, developed out of the, the folk culture as to what should be the best treatment. Uh, and they would enlist some doctors into them. Uh, the most um, uh, obvious example, by the way, of this kind of folk theme building up because of the hopelessness in most medical conditions was Christian science. I mean, it was essentially a folk idea that swept along and said, gee, you know, uh, um, doctors don't do you much good. Why don't you try this and, and we'll, we'll find a new way. But there are all kinds of other things medicines that would be taken from the American uh, natives, uh, all, all this uh, stuff would happen. But the Civil War drove it home. So doctors aren't much good to you, even though they talk therapy of various so kinds. And they always identify themselves, by the way, by saying, I'm a doctor of the homeopathic variety and things of that sort. Well, uh, I think you might be able to see that there's something like that now in psychiatry uh, at this time. But what Hopkins did, and the thing that was exemplified by Hopkins, and by the way, a couple of other places, uh, the University of Michigan, they said, this kind of treatment of therapy is a big mistake because the therapies don't rest on anything, really. And uh, there's no coherence to the therapies. Uh, they're all, in a sense, empiric. And our job is to train a new group of doctors. And uh, uh, this is the way we'll train them. 
We'll educate them in the basic sciences. Well, no, I'll put it around the other way. Because they were trained in darkness. Oops. Sorry, I'm, un I'm unleashed and unhinged. Um, we'll train doctors in two kinds of knowledge. One, we'll teach them how to recognize and differentiate disorders as they appear in the clinic so that they'll be able to tell the difference between typhoid and typhus, for example, and also show how uh, different people with the same condition uh, will uh, uh, show it differently. That is, an elderly person with pneumonia versus a young person with pneumonia. And secondly, though, as people begin to recognize these different disorders, we will as well teach them the basic sciences that illuminate the differences amongst these conditions, okay? We'll try to put these two things together. Now, they were lucky at the time uh, because they had a lot of good basic science that wasn't being taught to the, uh, to the doctors. There was, uh, you know, Koch had, uh, had discovered the tubercle bacillus. Um, uh, uh, it, it, the concept of pathology had moved out of uh, gross pathology into cellular pathology, and, and genetics was uh, uh, emerging. Uh, and what the idea at Hopkins was is that we were going to produce cohort after cohort of doctors that understood how to recognize disease on the one hand, and know the knowledge about the underpinnings of disease uh, out of basic science, and that eventually they would begin to discover rational treatments, rational treatments that would explain the particular phenomena of the disease out of the sciences that were there, okay? And the triumph of American medicine wasn't the discovery of new therapies because the doc simply because the doctors were trying one therapy after another. The triumph of American medicine was the development of concepts of therapy resting upon basic science and addressed to the particular conditions that were turning up in human life, okay? And we, we found cures and uh, treatments that are rational now. And in fact, even with the discovery of a new disease, like for example, the discovery of AIDS, I mean, that awful condition that appeared uh, was within a few years, at least its cause and its transmission was comprehended, not because people are out there doing therapy, therapy is still eluding us in that disease, but because we have basic scientists who had been studying the issues of viruses, the issues of immunology, the issues, in fact, of the way uh, DNA and RNA issues interrelate. And we dis we, we've discovered that. And, and we have won the confidence in medicine of the American public so that, that well, there are occasional fringe groups still that spring up but nowhere near as frequently as in the 19th century. And for the most part, we trust uh, the uh, science and the medical profession to advance in, um, in a way that uh, will, uh, will uh, cure and manage and understand disease, and we're prepared to be taxed for it and, and support it. Now, I say to you that the problem in psychiatry is the problem of medicine 100 years ago. Uh, we're out treating therapists. Everybody's a therapist uh, of a variety of sorts. And, I, you know, they, 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 they have a, there's a kind of theoretical underpinning of it, but everybody thinks you go to be a psychiatrist in training in order to be a therapist right off the bat. Well, that's not what I'm trying to do. And I don't think that's what American psychiatry ultimately will do. I think what American psychiatry ultimately will do is begin to teach people how to differentiate one psychiatric condition from another and ally ourselves with the basic scientists who tell us things about uh, how those conditions might emerge, whether those uh, conditions relate to the biological underpinnings 
to psychological phenomena like uh, what Elizabeth Loftus is teaching us about, uh, or about sociological things like Michael Kinney, Kinney was talking about. And our job in teaching psychiatry then is to bring on cohort after cohort of people who not only know how to recognize certain conditions, uh, at the present time, and even know which empirical medicines have been useful for them, like, for example, recognizing major depression and discovering that uh, these um, treatments, uh, like uh, antidepressant medications, are useful to them, but also beginning to study the brain and uh, the genetics and the life experience of people so as to put together a rational approach to these conditions and eventually apply it. And in that way, not launch yourself out into a sudden reach for an imaginary uh, culprit, an imaginary problem to explain conditions, a cult-like move, which has, I think, been part of the problem in this, in this arena. So what are we trying to do at Johns Hopkins now? We're simply trying to repeat the old Oslerian. It was William Osler at, uh, at uh, Hopkins that made this point most explicitly by saying, let's have a structure for, for medicine, medical teaching that includes wor working with patients and working to describe their problems and associating ourselves with basic scientists so as to teach uh, and learn the basic sciences that might apply. And, uh, I just want to show you um, a, a little structure that, uh, that we think is going to make psychiatry uh, less an, an amorphous subject, but a more coherent subject that relates what we observe in the patient to what is emerging in, in science. We think, in fact, there are four ways that psychiatrists think about patients and uh, relate their phenomena to what we know. And I want to go over them with you uh, just briefly. This is what, what we have called, uh, and you perhaps saw our little book out there, The Perspectives of Psychiatry. And, uh, and we use this uh, visual image uh, only to say, look, uh, this is several different ways that you have to look uh, as a psychiatrist in order to be able to identify the different phenomena that turn, out, uh, turn up in mental, mental conditions. And we say, for example, and uh, although we use the word perspective, they're fundamentally just logical methods or a kind of logical grammar to think about conditions. The first condition, the closest thing to medicine, is to say that uh, is what we call the, the perspective of disease. There are some patients, some psychiatric patients, that have diseases. Uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease. And that uh, work, that the concept, of the perspective of disease works by the logic of categories. And uh, uh, you might say the common sense of categories is to say that what we're looking at is something that the patient has. The patient has Alzheimer's disease. The patient has schizophrenia. The patient has major depression. And then the logic of this is to drive researchers and relate us to researchers that want to study aspects of the brain, uh, because it would be the brain that would be the uh, uh, essentially the site of disease that manifested itself in mental life. Oh, that is useful, by the way, to remind you what a psychiatrist are. Uh, before, I should have said that at the beginning. Psychiatrists are those medical doctors that look at patients uh, for problems in mental life and behavior. Okay, that, so it encompasses everything. It doesn't say we only look at patients that we think will respond to psychotherapy. Okay, no, notice what a difference it would be. So we're going to look at everything patients have in mental life and behavior, and we're going to try to understand those conditions, recognize them, tie them to science, and discover what treatments come from that, whether they be psychological treatments or other treatments. All right? I should have said that at the beginning. Uh, so the perspective of disease says that some patients have something, and we should try to find out why they have that something and how to treat it. The second perspective is what we call the perspective of dimensions, and that works by the logic of gradation and quantification. And that, uh, for example, uh, uh, 
makes a point that people differ in psychological characteristics. For example, people differ in their degree of extroversion or an introversion, as well as people differ, for example, in, in their, their uh, cognitive capacities. Some people are very, very intelligent. Some people are uh, very unintelligent. Now, uh, the important thing to know is that place that people uh, l live on the dimension of intelligence will affect what life they can lead, uh, what kinds of problems they will get. And if the doctors can't recognize those distinctions, they're going to find trouble. They should also, therefore, being interested in that, relate to the scientists that want to tell us uh, what is the foundations of these distinctions amongst human beings in which they differ quantitatively in psychological ways. And so we, we have people who study the, um, the issues of the development of intelligence and what intelligence is and whether it uh, is one thing or many things. And we psychiatrists want to learn from that because we want to find out about it. The third perspective is the perspective of behaviors. And that works by the logic of teleology or goals. And that says, sometimes the problem is what the patient does. Not what the patient has or what the patient is, but what the patient does. That is, he smokes cigarettes and gets into trouble because of that. Well, what is the drive that gets him to want to smoke cigarettes? And again, notice how we'd be relating ourselves to any of the sciences around us that would explain uh, the addictive process and make people interested in, uh, in, in trying to uh, both avoid the addiction and treat it. And not fall back on the idea that uh, the only reason why somebody is smoking is because he's trying to swallow his mother. I mean, I, I used to hear that. <laughs> it, it's just crazy. We want to know why he smokes and what is the drive for smoking and what we can do to prevent it. Finally, there is the logic of the life story. That is the logic of narrative. And that says that some of the problems turn up in life because of what the patient encounters. For example, we understand grief out of somebody having lost something. And we need to, to appreciate that some of our troubles are not because of something we have or are or do, but because of something we've encountered. But we want to know that the patient really did encounter that. And we want, therefore, to use the basic scientists that would tell us that often, as Robin Davis uh, Daza said, sometimes we write a story and make it uh, a false story uh, be and then believe it. And, and the, the, uh, by the way, I have my, my last little article in the American Scholar I'm going to appear in March is entitled, What's the Story? So that we can talk about it and speak about what these issues might, might do for us. Now, you see, if you lay the logics of the explanations out this way, you, you see that therapies become clear or at least what you want to do. What do you want to do with these different kinds of patients that you have out there? And how do you want to teach that to people? Obviously, if you have a disease, if you say, listen, these are people who have got a disease, ultimately you want to cure it. You want to cure a disease, or heal it, or treat it, or rehabilitate somebody who's been involved in a disease. And so somebody, who, again, someone who has a major depression, um, uh, should, uh, uh, we should be trying either to cure it or to, uh, or to heal it. But someone who has a dimensional problem, that is someone whose major problem is a lack of intelligence, let's say, well, you don't cure that. Uh, you, because you can't. You can't make everybody the same. You wouldn't want to anyway. And uh, both people of low intelligence and people of high intelligence can get into trouble in their lives for that, from that simple uh, reason. But instead of talking about cure in treatment, you talk about guidance. You want to help guide them. And guidance is often a psychological process of counseling and understanding. Behaviors like uh, smoking or other addictions or some other behaviors like anorexia nervosa. Well, you don't cure anorexia nervosa. It's not a disease. It is a behavior. You don't cure smoking, although people will tell you that you do, and occasionally they use it as a metaphor. But what you want to do is you want to interrupt the behavior. You want to stop it. 
And once you think about that, you see, another thing, uh, y y a gradual sense of logic in this discourse comes to life when people say, okay, you want to stop a behavior, then you say, okay, if you want to stop a behavior, you can't like it, and you've got to persuade people that this behavior is not good for them. And then a life story, uh, if you're working with a life story, you're not trying to cure somebody of grief, but you're going to help try to rescript the life so that it will, uh, it will help. Now, there are, once you start reasoning this way, you begin to see that there is red ink in every one of these therapies, uh, uh, once you understand. Now, eventually we will understand everything about the interaction between uh, science and these conditions. But we'll always have red ink in the treatments, okay? And everybody should, em should any doctor should emphasize it. In the process of educating people and trying to give coherence to this field, we should mention it. For example, you want to you wanna cure diseases, but all medicines are toxic. It's, it's true, you know, digitalis is a toxin. Uh, antidepressants are a toxin, lithium is a toxin, and, and we're occasionally told that by uh, a fellow psychiatrist. They say, you're giving lithium, don't you know what it does to the kidney? Of course I know what it does to the kidney. Uh, I, I'm just trying to um, employ it so it has a minimum damage to the kidney, and it helps the person from having recurrent manic depressive attacks. And uh, the balance of those things is important. In dimensions, when you're trying to guide somebody, all guidance is paternalistic. I know that. It's no news to me that, uh, to some way, that I am deciding and trying to help a person to see a life and see a course of, of, of action for themselves that would be more, more helpful to them. I try to tell people who have, uh, gee, normal IQs, uh, let's say an IQ of 95, I try to tell them, don't go to medical school. Don't try to go to medical school. Not because I don't. Not because I think that all of us doctors are so darn smart, but because I know that if you have an IQ of 95, it's going to be extremely hard for you. Not impossible, but extremely hard for you to carry on. So I want to guide you. That is paternalistic. I know it. Behavior. Stopping any behavior is to stigmatize it. Yeah, look, uh, I, we, the um, APA, once again showing its relative incoherence, had uh, a, uh, a, a meeting a few years ago stopping stigma in psychiatry. Well, I, there are certain things I want to stop stigma on. I want to stop stigma in major depression, schizophrenia, and all of that. But if you said to the people at the APA, how about destigmatizing smoking so that everybody can smoke anytime they want to, because it's okay. We don't want to stigmatize it. They'd go to the asteroid belt, I'm telling you. They say, no, we want to stop it. We know it's bad, and it's secondary smoke, and all this other stuff. And, uh, and, and by the way, I want to, I want to sti stop behavior, and, and I stigmatize it. And what do we do here today? In point of fact, and the pickets outside are not realizing, we hate pedophilic child abuse. We want to stop it. We stigmatize it. Okay? We stigmatize that behavior. Even though somebody could come to you and say, well, it's a kind of drive and an odd aspect of it. We say, right, but stop it. We don't want it. No young child love goes here. Okay? I'm serious about it. And uh, notice what it means. It means that some behaviors have to be stopped, and in the process of stopping any behavior, I know we stigmatize it. That's okay. Not so bad. Finally, the life story. The life story works on understanding, and sometimes interpreting. But everybody knows that all interpretations are hostile. They are. You can't, that's one of the reasons why have, we have to be very careful in talking to anybody in psychotherapy. We don't go up to them and, uh, in the first session and say, I recognize uh, your internal um, uh, uh, failure to uh, be able to adapt to crises. I mean, it's insulting. Uh, and it's not helpful. Uh, it might be true, it might not be true. Um, even though, by the way, it, it becomes cocktail party parlance, and you can go almost, I get, I get 
my behavior are often interpreted by lots of people as though they think, well, you know, in the modern era, psychotherapy letting us have uh, open interpretation, we can say anything we want to you. And so we say, well, um, uh, it'll be good for you, Paul, to know that, uh, you know, you have problems with authority. Right? <laughs> Uh, I was out on the West Coast for a while with friends. Friends of mine and I worked on the West Coast for a while, and we, we were trying to teach this uh, way of, of psychiatry, and uh, we would uh, uh, be told uh, um, right off the bat uh, uh, by somebody, say, I, I want to tell you about how, uh, uh, how you're burdened uh, uh, by your linear thinking. And I'd say, spare me, I said, spare me. <laughs> I know my problems. I wake up with them every day. But, but I don't need them to be interpreted. <clears throat> uh, and uh, all of these things apply. But ultimately, I hope you see that a structure uh, of, of, of uh, psychiatric teaching that follows the original Oslerian or Hopkins method, that is, not beginning with therapy, but beginning with observations and structure and a close association with real science that is occurring all around us and which you've heard a lot about today, uh, uh, not today, but uh, in this session, uh, produces a program that ultimately uh, releases our therapeutic aims and focuses them on where they're appropriate and permits us the important thing to agree and to disagree. Okay? The important thing and the thing that's going to bring uh, reconciliation to all of this is once we have a kind of, as we have a structure of reasoning about what can go wrong and what can go right in psychiatric conditions, once we have a way of talking to one another about what the knowledge base is and what the therapies that we are using today can do and what burdens are ready those that therapy brings with it, then we will have a, uh, a, uh, a resolution and an avoidance of this kind of serious mistake in psychiatric practice. Now, I, 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 um, I think that I, I, I had a couple of other things, but what do I do now? I'm pressing every button I know. <laughs> I have here, uh, uh, I, I did have a few things about what the ultimate aims of teaching are. They are to transmit skills and facts. They are intended to in enhance independence. And, uh, re these are, this is just the kind of program that we use at Hopkins. Uh, why do we, why do we want to do it? I'm going to spare you. Uh, it is a, an attempt to avoid this situation that we ultimately are trying to produce psychiatrists that really can understand what happens. Because if we don't, we'll find that we're in this kind of vortex again. Whatever the culture suggests. Today it's suggesting child abuse. Tomorrow it could suggest something else. What cu culture suggests is doctors develop, what doctors describe, patients supply, and what patients provide, culture confirms. That kind of vortex is what we're in today. And with a more coherent teaching of psychiatry, a more um, sound structural basis of the kind that I described, a more Oslerian one, we won't find more misdirections of psychiatry, but more coherence for it for the future. Thank you very much.